seconds. I usually have a ritual drum with me, but this time I forgot it, and I remember the cantella, which is really interesting. Um, and the sock will, will, will find out, usually plays a harp out of gold, but I think he rather likes the cantella because it's shaped like a wing. Do you want me to kill the fluorescence? Or? So, welcome to Sword, Harp, and Singing Bird. Um, I did the wrong switch, I'm sorry. And, um, going to be a, a short ritual and meditation to Enesok and Care Ibrami. Um, Enesok is a sort of a special right? friend of mine. He is an Irish god, and I've worked with his sister Bridget for many years. Um, and I often honored Enesok for my uh, springtime rites, my spring equinox rites. Um, he's also come to me during tough emotional times and has stayed ever since, and I consider him one of my main deities. He is associated with love and desire, youth and springtime, poetry and the arts, dreams and restful sleep. He is also a trickster god and a healer of the soul. Like all Celtic gods, he does lots and lots of different things. Please, if you have any questions or thoughts to share during my talk today, you can jump on in and make it a conversation. Um, lectures are sort of a default. Um, I, I prefer a conversation when they can happen, because you never know where they can lead, and trickster meetings like that. Um, and afterwards, we're going to do a um, short ritual and trance journey, focusing on what we learned today. I'm, um, I like etymology, so we're going to start off by looking at his name. Um, his name has been variously spelled and variously interpreted. I often pronounce it Ennis because I do the G-H in the middle. A lot of other people will go Angus because with the hard G. I think he answers to either, so you're, you're good either way. Um, I think Celtic deities understand that Americans cannot pronounce their names. <laughs> <laughs> they are okay with that for the most part. Um, scholar and linguist Mary Louise Siostet um, interprets Ennis as meaning unique force. Celticist Mary Jones translates his name as meaning chosen one. <coughs> Other writers connect it to the Gaulish name Oin Augustus, which can be interpreted as one choice or one strength. And his title is a little bit more uh, consistent. O, with the fada over the O, simply means young. Mak O means young son. So you see Ennis Mak O, uh, Ennis the young son. There are other variants. Makin Ulk means son of the young or son of youth. Enes Makin Ulk. Makin Ulk means son of the two young ones, which perhaps refers to his parents, who are the Dagda and the river goddess Bowen, who we'll meet a little bit later in our discussion today. I like to interpret his name as a riddle of sorts the one choice of the young, or the one strength of the young. And as we'll see, he's quite fond of riddles. So how would you answer this one? What is the one choice of the young? Hmm. To have a good time. That's a good answer. <laughs> also else? the one choice of the old, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Adventure. Imagination. Responsibility or not to responsibility <laughs> is the question. <laughs> I think the answer you give gives an insight into who Anisok is and what he's about, because they're all correct. There's no wrong answer to that riddle. Um, and that's one of the reasons he's such an amazing God to explore, because you never know where that thread is going to take you. He's associated with birds of various kind, hence the feathers on the altar. Swans appear in various myths, and he takes the form of a swan with his wife, Ker Ibomi. Um, he also has four singing birds that continually circling his head, bringing love and joy, um, and pro perhaps providing a way to drive away insects. <laughs> but um, they don't say what kind of birds those are. Um, I often see them as chickadees, but they, they're probably regional, depending on where, uh, where you are. There are other descriptions that show him playing a harp of gold, drinking the ale of immortality, as, as do all the Tuatha Jadanen. 
uh, and using his cloak to protect uh, chosen lovers, often spiriting away, them away from all who would get uh, in the way of their affair. In a larger sense, he appears to be the same god as the Welsh Mabin and the Gaulish Maponos, who is the divine youth. The Romans interpreted him in Interpretatio Romana as Apollo. Um, I kind of disagree with Interpretatio Romana for a lot of the deities in the Celtic pantheon, uh, but we'll go into that a little bit later. To draw on a wider range of Indo-European mythology, he has co uh, qualities in, in common with Kama, who is the Indian uh, god of love, uh, and the Norse god Baldur. Um, but he isn't some kind of winged um, Victorian Cupid figure. And actually, if you go to uh, Roman mythology, Cupid wasn't a winged Victorian Cupid figure either. <laughs> oh, silly Victorians. <laughs> Somehow everything they produce is slightly historically questionable. <laughs> to use a Greek analogy, he's equal parts Eros, Apollo, and Hermes, the lover, the poet, and the trickster. He is, his is the primeval force that shatters the arbitrary chains of tradition, a bit like sex itself. And I'll repeat that little phrase, the primeval fo force that sh shatters the arbitrary chains of tradition. It's a mouthful, but it kind of gets to the heart of, of who Ennis Ock is. Love in Celtic myth has swan wings and a harp, but he also carries a sword and he is willing to cut off your head with it. Um, he's not blind, he's pretty sharp-sighted and also very smart. He is also the brother or the half-brother of Bridget, uh, which is what I mentioned in my preamble. Bridget's mother is never named in the lore. Um, some modern pagans, using unverified personal gnosis, of course, believe that her mother is Bowen the river goddess, the same as Enesoc. So others believe that her mother is Anu, who is another name for the Morrigan. Um, your mileage may vary. It's all UPG. Quite a few Indo-European cultures have a set of male and female twins associated with what Dumazi would call third function concerns. And third function concerns are fertility, the earth, the stuff of life the stuff that the priests and the warriors don't typically worry about. These twins are often associated with the qualities of light. Frey and Freya of the Vanir are, are the most famous example of those twins. But there are others, Apollo and Artemis, if you look in Greek tradition. <coughs> um, there are some in Roman myth, and not just the ones that they stole from the Greeks, Liber and Libera. Um, Slavic mythology has a whole bucket load of those male-female uh, twins. Kostromo and Kostromo, La Yarilo and Yarila, Kupalo, Kupala, Lado and Lado. In Indian mythology, the deities are also in male-female pairs, with the goddess being the Shakti or the enlivening force. Although in India, the gods aren't usually seen as brother and sister, but as husband and wife. Um, so it's a little bit inter different interpretation. I have a gut feeling, my unverified personal gnosis, that Ennis and Bridget may have functioned in a way similar to Frey and Freya, or the Slavic pairs of deities. I haven't done an in-depth in exploration on this yet, but it feels right. And when you look at some of their attributes, um, it seems correct. At any rate, if you're drawn to Bridget, don't be surprised if her brother shows up at some point, too. Like all brothers, he likes to gate crash. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately enough, considering his trickster nature, Enesolf has his beginning in a love that crosses boundaries. So now we're in the mythology portion, so we get to know our god a little bit better today. His parents, the two young ones, are the river goddess Bowen and the father god Dagda, who is associated with rain and fertility and loves big poles in the earth, as we found out the other night, um, among other, many other things. I've always liked the poetic nature of that pairing. If you think about it, the river is filled by the rain. That's the very beginning. The origins of sex is the river being filled by the rain. 
Um, there's a catch, however. Bowen is already married to a god who's called Elkmar or Nekton, and he may actually be the same god as, as Nuada, Argetlam, or Silverhand, mm -hmm. the Tuatha Jadanan god associated with rulership, justice, the sword, and the law. Nekton is also associated in myth directly with sacred wells, the fresh water that comes from the ground. In some versions of her myth, Bowen walks around his sacred well, Widdershins, the wrong way, which ends up causing the waters to rise from the ground, follow her, destroy her body, and turn her into the Boyne River. At any rate, after Bowen has sex with the Daiva, her husband doesn't know that she's pregnant. Nekton has to be tricked to allow Enesok to be born at all. Um, Elkmar, the other name for this particular deity, is Daga's steward in some stories. So the Daga sends him off on an errand, and the gods stop the passage of the sun in the sky, making a single day last for nine months and allowing the son of the young to be born. At his birth, Bowen said, young is the son who was begotten at break of day and born betwixt it and evening, which is the origin of his title and a hint of his relationship with time. Bowen, interestingly enough, never leaves her husband, and it's perhaps telling that Enesoc was born of the affair of the heart rather than a sanctioned marriage. He is sent to his brother Midyar to raise. Midyar's name seems to mean something like a judge. I have always interpreted him as being the Celtic moon god, but that is a whole other topic for a whole other day. Ennis later helps his foster father Midyar in his own matters of the heart, winning him the hand of the lovely goddess Edeen through a series of impossible tasks with, with some help from their dad, the Dharma. Of course, this conveniently ignores the fact, as Ennis often does, that Midyar is already married to the goddess Flumach, and um, doesn't really matter. Midyar and Edeen live with Ennis for a year, perhaps circumventing the rule, and this was a real rule in Irish society, in which the elder wife would be able to work her will against the new bride during the first days of a partnership. So if your husband married a, another woman and brought her into the household, you could do anything to her um, for the first few days. You, you couldn't cause permanent damage, you couldn't kill her, but you can make her like a living hell. So they uh, worked around that and went to stay somewhere else during that period. Boonmok was very clever, and she <coughs> gets access to a dean, and she turns her into a jeweled insect. I, I often see that as a butterfly, and I think most people interpret it that way. Ennis provides a dean as the butterfly a home and protection in the form of a glass room. But Boonmok is very, very clever, and she tricks Ennis and Midyar away from Adine for a second time, and then she uses a druidic wind to blow her from the, the other world into the land of time and the land of mortals. And that's when Ennis all gets really pissed off. Um, he ends up taking out his sword and beheading Spoonmok with it, killing her, which is not, it's hardly the um, action you would associate with a fuzzy Cupid type of deity. So that's, we're going to go back and revisit the, the myth of Vajir and the Dean a little bit later. Um, it's a very long and complicated myth and a very beautiful one, which I, which I really enjoy. In short, propriety and social rules don't seem to matter too much of Enesoc. And throughout myth, he supports the path of the heart, no matter what the cultural ramifications are or the consequences. He also meddles in human affairs of the heart, though often more as a protector of lovers than as an instigator. He has a foster son named Jeremage of the Love Spot. And Jeremy has a magical mark on this spot that makes any woman who sees him fall in love with him. As a, as a woman with moles, I really appreciate that story. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy tries to keep that spot covered, but he inevitably slips up. And of course, he, flips, he slips up at his boss's wedding, his boss being the uh, Finn McCool. And 
Finn is getting married to a young woman named Grenya. And it should be noted that Grenya was not particularly thrilled to be married off to Finn. He was a lot older than her and probably the result of an arranged marriage. So she probably was looking for a better opportunity. So one love potion and a gesh later, <laughs> she overrides Jeremy's objections and forces him to run away with her. Interestingly, Enesop blesses this love and spirits the couple away in his cloak of invisibility whenever Finn and his men get too close. He also gives Jeremidge advice on how to keep one step ahead of Finn. And later, when Jeremidge gets caught and has to fight, um, he spirits Grenya away to safety. When Jeremidge does fight Finn's men, he uses Ennis's uh, sword, Mononon's spear, and a hefty dose of trickery to win the day. Jeremidge and Grenya have years together um, as husband and wife until the former breaks his own gish or his own vow he hunts a boar, um, resulting in the inevitable. For those who don't know, a gish is sort of a, a vow that you make, but it binds you. It's it, If you say that I can never hunt boar, and if you do, you um, are led to your destruction, to your death. And in Jeremich's case, there's a whole long complicated story in why he couldn't hunt boar. Apparently his brother was turned into one. So the boar gores him. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Finn can heal him if he brings him water from his hands. And every time Finn goes to the stream to bring the water back, he thinks about Jeremich running off with Renya opens his hands and lets the water fall through. After three rounds of this, um, Jeremich dies. And uh, after Jeremich's death, Grenya goes back to Finn and lives the rest of her life out as the chief's wife, just like she was supposed to in the beginning. I'm reminded of Aphrodite at various points during the myth. If you read the Iliad, she protects Paris and Helen in much the same way as Ennis Auk protects Jeremich and Grenya. One of her beloved mortals, Adonis, is also slain by a boar. There are resonances there, Edward Ennis Auk playing essentially the same role as Aphrodite. Hmm. Whether that's from a shared cultural strata, dating from Indo-European myth, or a, la a later influence from classical myth, just is likely considering the classical education of monks. Um, I'm not sure. You can, you can debate it either way, but at least today those resonances are in the story. As, evidence, as evident from his start in life, Enesoc has a complex relationship with time and its manipulation. If you read the um, myth of Nijir and Nadim, and it's one of the longer ones that come from Celtic culture, uh, there's repeated transformations and reincarnations of a dean. Um, she's continually gained and lost by Najir. And to me, that's a cycle reminiscent of the waxing and waning moon. That's why I think Najir is a uh, moon god. Enesoc gains his home of Brunaboyne, which includes Newgrange, um, through the verbal manipulation of time concepts and a trick of grammar. The brew belong to Dada or Elkmar. Um, usually it's Dada. Um, and Ennis, like the young son he is, asks his dad to borrow the house for a day and a night. We don't say why. <laughs> you can use your imagination why Ennis wants to borrow the house. Dad, Dada, understands parties. He's a good guy. <laughs> Says sure. Day and a night. You, you can have your party and then, you know give it back. So the next day, when the doctor returns home, Ennis will not give him the keys. Irish, as it happens, has no article that differentiates a day from day itself. Or as Ennis says in the story, it is clear that day and night are the whole world, and it is that which has been given to me. So it's a bit of trickery that would make the Greek Hermes proud, and I would not <laughs> recommend trying that on people in your own. From his conception, Ennis Auk alters the perception of time, but not time, him, time itself. So it may seem like the day he was born um, 
was one very long day, but really it did last nine months. It, it's, it's a perceptual trick. He doesn't stop the sun's passage. He doesn't count the years of a dean's loss. Other gods do that. Instead, he's an illusionist, making us question the reality of what we see and experience, and to look for the loopholes in the contract. In some senses, he stands outside of time, a perspective that influences the one choice that must be made. And these choices aren't just limited to love. He advises his father, for example, to trick a ravenous Bovora satirist named Krijimbel by mixing gold into his food. Krijimbel, whose name means gold mouth, ironically enough, is poisoned by eating the gold, but that provides the die-die now by at the very same time. So it's a nice little masterful trick. Ennis also interacts with time in another way by freeing the light and the warmth of spring. According to Scottish myth, the Coilic, the goddess of winter, imprisons Bridget in a mountain, and Ennis rides in on a white horse to save her. The god associated with love, poetry, youth, and springtime frees the goddess of fire and inspiration, and together they bring spring to the wintry land. Ennis is also the focal point of a myth called uh, Ashlinga Onguso, the vision of Engus. And um, for a year, he sees this beautiful woman in his dreams every night, and she's playing either a harp or a lute. He falls deeply in love with her and begins to pine away. So physicians call his mother Bowen, who searches the world for the woman to no avail. Then they call Nandaga, the who has a very typical Daga response. The quote is, what is the use of talking to me? I know more than, I don't, I know no more than you do. <laughs> the doctor, <laughs> though, he calls, you know, even though he, he gives a kind of a catty answer, he calls in his son Bojerk, whose name is Red Raven, and who's associated with arcane knowledge. Bo finds the woman in question at the Lake of the Dragon's Mouth, and her name is Kir Ivami, which means Newberry. He takes Ennis to the link, and Ennis recognizes Care. She wears a silver band around her neck, connected by gold chains to 150 other women also standing in the lake. Ennis then goes to Queen Maeve, who's the ruler of the land, and invites Care's father, Ethel Anvil, uh, to her hall. Ethel refuses to come, so Ennis and the dog do decide to overrun Ethel Shemount. Huh? Amid some threats, Ethel tells them that he has no power to give his daughter care to them because she's a shapeshifter whose power exceeds his own, and possibly that of Ennis. After <coughs> a little ungentle prodding, he tells them she can't be won by either force or trickery. And she also tells them another important thing. She changes shapes at Samhain, um, every Samhain at the lake. So on Samhain, Ennis goes to the lake, and he is given a challenge. You can have care if you can find her. He sees 150 identical swans on the lake where the young women once stood, all of them wearing silver collars attached to each other by gold chains. So this is the huge, huge challenge. How do you find the swan? Well, he simply calls to her, introduces herself, and asks her consent to marry. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she gives it, provided that he allows her to return to the lake whenever she wants to return. And he said, sure, no problem. You can go anywhere you want to go. Um, so they fly off together in the shape of swans. And as they fly, they sing the song that puts all who hear it into blissful slumber for three days. The Reese brothers compare this story to the Indian tales of the Gandharvas, who are nature spirits who ap appear as half bird and half man. Their wives, the Apsaras, are water nymphs. Kama, the god of love, whom I said is somewhat similar to Ennis, is also called the Gandharva. Shape-shifting swan maidens also exist in various Indo-European mythologies and in fol folklore around the world as the animal bride. I think the story is very reminiscent of the Roman story of Cupid and Psyche, except the roles are reversed. It's the god who must pursue the soul and win her hand. 
And being wooed by a god is really kind of like that. So it's a, a good myth for modern pagans. Force and flattery cannot win care, only the ability to choose the beloved correctly. And that's a motif that also resurfaces in Vijir and Adin. Uh, um, during one of her human incarnations, Adin uh, is married to a human king. And Majir tells the king that he has to pick out which of these young women is Adin. If he can pick out his wife correctly, he can keep her. Hmm. Unfortunately, the king picks his own daughter, so he loses his wife, Adin, to her true husband, Majir, and she returns with Majir to the other world. True love, above all, is about consent. Ennis asks care for her consent, and she gives it, and they live happily ever after in freedom and choice. So another reason I think this myth is important to modern pagans. So why is the god of love married to a yew berry? Yew trees live a very long time, and they're associated with immortality. The wood is very hard to burn, and apparently it was the favored material for druid wands, which could explain Kara's association with magic. The story of Kara and Ennis can be seen as the definition of ideal love, seeking, finding, asking consent, and giving it in free will. You can also see it as the artist's pursuit of the muse. And the scholar James McKillop actually views Ennis as the god of poetry rather than the god of love, and the interpretation holds just as well for that. The, the myth itself can also be seen as the sacred's courtship and relationship with the soul. And the soul, the soul of all of us, has its own free will and agency. A few more things before we go on to our trance journey portion. Um, Caitlin Matthews considers Ennis to be a powerful, quote, healer of souls and the primary guardian of the soul shrine with his sister Bridget. And my own experience bears that out. If you remember the birds around his head, whose tunes inspire joy, love, and release from depression, Ennis and Care also bring restful sleep to those who hear them sing. So all of those things are good for, for people who are, are suffering emotionally. In another story, when his brother Midgir loses his eye breaking up uh, a quarrel, apparently Midgir seems to be accident prone, Ennis brings the physician John Keck to heal him. He protects Edine when she's in the shape of the fly. He can't heal you physically, but he can help you get the help that you need, and he can help ease your soul and, and your spirit when you are weary and when you are depressed. As spring edges into fullness, allow your soul to listen to the song of Ennis, his birds and his heart, <coughs> his longing and his love. Like springtime himself, he's fresh and new, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. That force, the force of love, binds us to the cosmos and its cycles. Ennis Auk is a manifestation of this force, which is not limited to lovers or the young, but feeds all who drink from its sweet waters. Do you have any questions left before we get on to the meditation <coughs> portion? Already in a meditate, or do you, does anyone need a bathroom break? Yeah, bathroom break. Okay, bathroom break. <laughs> I'll start, start playing this thing when we're, we're ready to get started. meditation more than just thinking, I gotta pee. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> Actually, you know, the, the, like, 200 teenagers first night. <laughs> they, they calm down once you do the, once you do the outside is off. Yeah, there's something about that. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I would still argue that that could fade into white noise. Bladders, no. <laughs> I couldn't get that. I, I, I wouldn't do that meditation real quick. <coughs> I think it's just more of a grabbing and settling and just listening to you. So what did you say so the now, instrument that you're playing is again? This is called a cantella, which is a Finnish zither. Um, you find the same instrument in Slavic countries too, where it's called a goose leaf. Okay. 
I, I generally play it by fucking. Mm-hmm. But you can also play it by strumming and... It's a folk instrument. Traditionally, they had five strings in Finland. Um, I have a five string one at home as well. Now they make concert varieties with a zillion strings, but originally was was a folk instrument. Hmm. It's very pretty. It has a lovely tone to yeah. it. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. I remember seeing video of a similar instrument, but with the multiple strings. Mm. The guy using hammers to. Uh, I mean, a hammer dulcimer, if you think about it, is just a giant zither, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. you're just hitting you're hitting the strings that are with with hammers. I have them at home too. I have a lot of things in the zither family. And pretty much what makes things a zither rather than a harp is that the strings all go over the sound box, mm -hmm. versus a harp where it goes through the air. <coughs> Pretty much unplayable because there's a big crack down the back of the, uh, the wood piece. Is it an auto harp? It's a what? Is it an auto harp? I have no idea. Auto harps are big scissors, but they also have these. Um, you can do chords on them. You press oh. buttons and <coughs> bars come down that that hit some of the strings that create chords. There's As no buttons on this. Okay. This the stamp on it says 18. That's why I thought it might be a, a. That's why I thought it might be an auto harp, or at least part of it. it they could have lost the part that goes on top of the, the metal bars, because that oh. was a common instrument back in the late 1800s. Oh, okay. Okay. 